All right, good evening, everybody. I'm not sure Chris was doing me a favor to put me up against Dabo Sweeney, but uh, <clears throat> we'll have a good time here tonight. Appreciate y'all being here. If you haven't seen that movie, go see it. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm itching to go see it, so I'm, I'm hoping to get there soon. We're in Romans chapter 8. We're in the last part of the passage, and they'll wrap it all up next week. You know, what you see here in chapter 8, and what you were seeing there with the movie, was they were putting the movie and the movie in the context of what was going on in the culture and how desperate the culture was because it was fractured and, and divided over so many things at that time. And, you know, it's fractured and divided over so many things today too, isn't it? But the, the culture that the gospel came into was also fractured and divided and desperate. <clears throat> and that's what you really see you can't really appreciate chapter 8 of Romans unless you really get the context in which it came. And so when you read, if you go back, if you take some time this weekend if you hadn't already done it, go back and read chapter 6 and 7. And I know Chris went over that some right before we started Romans chapter 8. He went over 6 and 7. And in 6 and 7, you see the work of God in Christ, but you see people struggling with their slavery to sin and the call of the Spirit to righteousness. And you see Paul declaring that there's this war going on between my spirit wants to do the right thing, but my flesh does the wrong thing. And the thing I don't want to do, I end up doing. And the thing that I do want to do, I end up not doing. And so you see that struggle and that conflict. And it's into this, into this conflict that, that Paul brings Romans chapter 8. And it's the solution to the problems of 6 and 7. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We pray, Lord, that you would anoint our time together tonight. Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit. Lord, it is my prayer tonight. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit would use the word of God to make a fresh imprint on our hearts of how awesome and inspiring and breathtaking the love of God is. Holy Spirit, help us to see that and to not just read these words and hear teaching we've heard before, <clears throat> but Lord, help us to grab a hold of what this is all about. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're reading the Bible and you're in Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7, and you see this, I mean, he ends chapter 7 with, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? In other words, I am a mess, and I can't get out of my way, and I can't get out of myself. I am desperate. And it's into that that you have Romans 8, chapter 1. He makes this big declaration, and he's going to make another big declaration in the same passage that we're going to read tonight. But in Romans 8, chapter 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In other words, you have been set free. The, the, <clears throat> the door to your cell has been flung open. The question is, is will you walk out of it? Or will you stay in your captivity? And he's saying that 
when you believe in Jesus Christ, that door swings open and you have the opportunity to walk free. <clears throat> and so they've been talking about that all as we've been going through chapter 8. Then you come to this other big declaration. So in 8 chapter 1, verse 1, he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then in chapter, in verse 31, he says, if God is for us, who could be against us? End of story. End of argument. That's the deal. That is the solution to the problem of chapter 6 and chapter 7. Let's go ahead and just read the last part of chapter 8 here. We'll start with verse 30. I know that was touched on last week, but it flows into our lesson tonight. Chapter 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. <clears throat> no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He ends it right there with what is all this about? It's about that last phrase, the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That changes everything. Romans chapter 8 is about the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what the Bible is about. It is about the love of God. If your life has been changed by Jesus... It is because of his love for you. It has confronted you. It has captured you. It has pursued you. It has compelled you. It has completed you. The love of Jesus is the key to the gospel. It's the key to the kingdom. It's the key to everything is God's love for you. And when we can grasp that, when we can look at that, when we can fathom that, it changes everything. You know, I like to watch the, the TV show. It comes on in the summer as the TV series Alone. I've talked about it up here before. And it's, it's about people who go out in the wilderness with their wilderness skills, and they're by themselves, and they're able to... <clears throat> They're tracked and monitored, but they have to film. They have like, like 50 pounds of camera equipment. They have to learn how to film themselves and everything. And they have a phone, an emergency phone, where they can tap out at any point. 
And then, and then what they do is they stay out there and they test themselves. And the last person who stays out there alone, the longest, wins. The thing is, is that, <clears throat> and one of the guys, in one of the tapes, it says, a guy says, if you're going to do this, you had better like yourself. <laughs> because you're alone with yourself. And so when we come to Romans chapter 8 and 6 and 7, I mean, does that sound like someone who likes himself? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, Paul doesn't like who he is without Jesus. He loves who Jesus is making him to be. And that's what he's trying to get everyone to grasp. What he's trying to everybody get, get everyone to grasp is this. <clears throat> is that Jesus is everything. And God's love is most fully expressed in his life, death, and resurrection. And that has to grab hold of you. But everything in our world fights against that. Because in chapter 6 and chapter 7, it's showing us what happens when our flesh world, our natural nature, our natural corruption of rebellion against God that most of us have lived in more of our life than not is confronted by the glory of God and the call of God and the love of God and the grace of God. <clears throat> and so you've got this battle. Because <clears throat> what happens is when you come to the gospel we are naturally wired for self-protection. We are naturally wired for self-promotion. We are naturally wired for self-satisfaction. That's the way we are designed by sin when it took over. And that's what Paul was talking about in 6 and 7. He says, listen, when sin came into my life, it deceived me. It tricked me. It imprisoned me. It killed me. It undid me. And when it did, I became wired for self-promotion, self-protection, and self-satisfaction. And then I encountered the love of God. And when the Spirit of God came into my life, it says self, it wired me for self less and others more. Jesus rule over self-rule. And holiness and surrender and sacrifice over serving myself. And so what you have is we, we find ourselves in these desires in conflict. There's desires that the Spirit of God is imparting to us through our faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's our flesh that's been programmed. Our body has been programmed and our brain has been programmed against the law of the Spirit of grace. And so we have this battle, and often we feel so defeated in this battle. And that's where Satan wants us. He wants us to feel defeated. He wants us to feel worthless. He wants us to feel hopeless. He wants us to feel that it's useless to keep trying to live for God. And he's right, because if you're trying in your own power to live for God, you're going to meet miserable failure. And I can't think of a better example of that <clears throat> than when Peter, you know, has told Jesus that he will, he will go to the death with him. And Jesus lets him know, before the cock crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. And the passion really captures that of how defeated we can feel spiritually sometimes. Look at this clip. And Bar
That's what Romans 6 and 7 looks like. <clears throat> and that's what Satan wants us to feel like. He wants us to see our sin. He wants us to see our inconsistencies. <clears throat> and he wants us to give up. And if you stayed in 6 and 7, you might be tempted to give up. You also have to remember here that this is Peter before the Holy Spirit came after Jesus' resurrection. This is Peter trying to follow God in his own effort, in his own power. This is Peter trying his best. And he fails miserably. And when we're trying our best for God, we fail miserably. If we're trying to live a supernatural life in human power, it fails miserably. 
But if you remember, Jesus tells Peter, he says, he did tell him that he would deny him before the cock crows, but he also told him that Satan had, divided, had requested to sift him like wheat. And Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. And he said, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus foreseeing all that and seeing the struggle and seeing the failure still loves Peter, still prays for Peter, still believes in Peter and what he and the Holy Spirit can do through Peter. And no matter what your failures or struggles are, no matter what vices or sins so easily wrap around your feet, God still believes in you. The Holy Spirit is still there making freedom available to you when you are ready to surrender and to choose righteousness. Because Romans 8 <clears throat> comes into this <clears throat> condemnation of wretched man that I am and says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus took your condemnation to the cross and to the grave and dumped it and defeated it. And therefore, if God is for you, nothing can stand against you because of the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is what Paul is trying to imprint on our hearts. Don't take the love of Jesus for granted. Don't take the gift of Jesus for granted. Don't become so familiar with the story and the information that it loses its power and its awe-inspiring message that in spite of the wretchedness that we can be, God's love for you prevails. And so Paul, what Paul is wanting us to do is he's wanting us to see what God has done and come out of this chapter of Romans chapter 8. He wants you to be confident. He wants you to be confident in your relationship with God. He wants you to be confident in what Jesus has done for you. He wants you to be confident in who God is making you to be. He wants you to be confident that God is not going to give up and he's going to continue to work in you until he completes that work. And he is going to continue. You can be confident that he's going to continue to work in you until you begin to have victory. And you see that with Peter. I mentioned this the last time I spoke up here, is that you have Peter going from this place right here to once the Holy Spirit comes, as Jesus promised um, at, the, at, the, at Pentecost, then after that, you have Jesus, or you have Peter standing up in front of the same people that were in this crowd that he was afraid of. He, he is standing before <clears throat> the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the high priest, and the high priestly family in Acts chapter 4. And he stands up in the power of Jesus and he calls them all out. So the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus, but more importantly, the love of Jesus that Peter encounters that restores him, takes him from this place right here to this place of standing before the very people he was afraid of in confidence. Romans 8 should make you confident. And here's some reasons. When you look at Romans 8, what you see is that the work of the love of God is complete. Okay, it's complete. It's not lacking anything. So one of the reasons that, that Paul is being compelled by the Holy Spirit to write Romans is because believers, especially the Gentiles believers, are being told that they are inadequate because they are Gentiles. They do not have the Jewish heritage They've got to add things. You know, the gospel is great, but you've got to add the feast. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to be this. You've got to be that. You have other people preaching different variations and twists on the gospel, and they're changing the story of Jesus. 
And Paul wants us to know that the work of the love of God is complete. And you see that in Romans 8, verse 30. God chose you. He predestined. He chose. He called. He justified you or he qualified you. And he has glorified you. You see that when you read in Ephesians, when you read in Ephesians, it says that God has blessed us with every blessing in Jesus Christ. It says he has sealed us by the Holy Spirit and he has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. In other words, it's all past tense. It's all completed. It may not all be revealed and manifested yet, but in Christ, everything that needs to be done to cancel the debt of sin against you, everything that needs to be done to make you prevail spiritually is available to you. There is nothing lacking in what Jesus has done. You can be confident that God's work in you is complete and you are lacking nothing that you need to follow God. You just have to surrender to his lordship, you've got to access those blessings by walking in that love and responding to it. We can't add to it, but we can honor it. And so when we give to charity, we're not trying to earn our way to heaven in addition to what Jesus has done. We are honoring what Jesus has did because of his charity to us, we extend that charity to others. Because of his forgiveness for us, we extend that forgiveness to others. Because of his love for us, we extend that love for others. The work in Jesus is complete. The other thing that you, you see here, and especially in our passage tonight, is that the love of God is secure. It's set and it's secure. Look at verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then in verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? Or... He says, in all these things we conquer, he says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, or powers, heights, depths, or anything else in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God. So what he's saying here is this. That what God has done in your life cannot be overpowered, overridden, or rescinded. When we use the word rescinded, it means it can't be revoked, it can't be canceled, and it can't be repealed. It's done. There is no argument, there is no accusation, and there is no action that this world or the spiritual world can throw at us that can shake the love of God for us and in us. In other words, there is nothing. Because here's the deal. You've won the war. What is the greatest need? The greatest need is to be rightly rated God and prepared for salvation in eternity, removing the sting of death and the penalty of sin. And when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, he eradicated all of that. He took it to the cross. He took it to the grave. And then he ascended to the throne where he acts as your high priest praying for you. Now the, now the world wants to attack that. Satan wants to attack it. Jesus said in John 14, 30, the, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no claim on me. If he has no claim on Jesus, then he has no claim on you. You hear that? If he has no claim on Jesus, he has no claim on you. The scriptures also say in 1 John 3, it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. 
The scripture keeps pointing us back to the love of God as displayed in Christ Jesus in his death on the cross. So we love in word and deed, listen to this, not only does Satan try to condemn us and accuse us and attack us, but our own heart often does that. We have to deal with our own heart, our own fallenness. He says we reassure our hearts before him, and if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. That's 1 John 3. Sometimes your heart falsely condemns you. Sometimes your heart fails to recognize the miraculous event that the Holy Spirit has done in your life. Our fallen nature sometimes tries to stay imprisoned in that cell. And the Holy Spirit draws us out. The work of God is secure. I think, you know, it's interesting. You know, you have a lot of times soldiers will not counsel with someone who's not a soldier. Because you don't have legitimacy, because a civilian hasn't been there. There's, there's this integrity and authenticity of, I need to know you've been in a foxhole like I've been in a foxhole. I need to know that you've had bullets whizzing by your head like I've had bullets whizzing by my head. I need to know that you know what it's like to, to, to be under fire like I've been under fire. And if you haven't been there, you don't get it. And so there's this authority of experience. Well, when Paul gives you this list, where does he get that list from? How does he know that the love of Christ is sufficient no matter what this world throws at you? Because of what he's been through. Listen to this list. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this. Five times he was given 40 lashes minus one. In other words, 40 lashes were considered a death sentence, so he was given 39. Five times. And yet he says the love of Jesus is strong enough for that. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned. In one situation in Acts, it talks about how he was stoned and he was left for dead. And when he came to, he walked right back into the city. So he says, the love of Jesus cannot be demolished by five death sentences, almost three rod beatings, being stoned and left for death. Then he talks about being shipwrecked three times. And one time he was in the, in the sea just drifting for a day and a night. And he says, even when I'm drifting in the darkness in that water, the love of Jesus is with me. He goes on to say, I was in danger from rivers, from robbers, from my own people, from Gentiles, from false brothers, in toil, in hardship, in sleepless nights, in hunger, in thirst, imprisonment, no food, cold, and exposure. And he says, in all these circumstances, I was never alone. I was never alone. I am never alone. And I'm telling you through experience that the love of Jesus is sufficient. And it will not fail. That's the authority and the life experience that Paul is speaking from. But then the last thing he wants us to see, and I hope we can really grasp, is that the work of the love of God is just, it's just mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. And so what he does is he refers us back to verse 32. You saw it in 1 John when I read a minute ago. He said, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. So John also refers back to the cross. 
If you want to know how much God loves you, look at the cross. Verse 32, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's a lot of words for God to say this. If I give you my son, I'm giving you everything in my heart. Everything in my heart is for If God is for us, who can be against us? God's saying is, you know that you have everything in my heart because I gave you my son. And there's nothing that you will encounter or go through that you will ever be alone or that my love is not sufficient because you have all of me committed to you. And if you're, if you're, if you have a Jewish background, which many of the people that he was writing to, both Gentiles and Jews, when you see this, if he has given us his, his son, how will he not freely give us all things? It immediately takes you back to Genesis, where Abraham is asked to offer Isaac. And of course, God doesn't believe in human sacrifice, and God stops him and provides a substitute which is the whole gospel story in that a substitute is given in the place of Isaac and Isaac is spared just as Jesus was given our place and we're spared. But look what Genesis 22 verse 15 says. It says, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. There's a prophecy right there of Jesus Christ. In other words, Abraham, what I didn't require of you, I will require of myself. And just, but see, the thing here was that when Abraham was willing to offer his son, God is saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you because I know that if you're willing to offer your son... I have all your heart. All your heart is with me. And so God now says to you, if I have given you my son, all my heart is with you. And if all my heart is with you, no one can take it from you. You need to be confident knowing that you can come boldly into the throne of heaven with confidence that you belong there, that God wants you there, and he wants you to come there to receive the help, the need, the grace, the mercy, the strength, the encouragement that you need to face everything that this world throws at you. But it is available there to you because the work of Jesus is complete. Your high priest is in heaven praying for you. The work of Jesus is secure, and the Holy Spirit has sealed you, and you have been blessed, and you have been seated in heavenly places. It cannot be taken from you, because God is for you. And he says, if you're ever tempted to doubt that I'm with you, that I'm in this for you, that I am available to you, then look at the cross. Because if I did not withhold my only son from you, then I will I not also give you all things. You have won. The war is over. Skirmishes may be taking place, but the war is over. Victory has been declared. 
You don't have to be like those Japanese soldiers that were hiding in the Philippines for 29 years after the war and surrendered for a war that was over in 1945 and they didn't surrender until 1974. This one guy, he surrendered in 1974 and then he died in 1979. He went into the jungle at 20 and then died in his 70s with only five years of freedom after he finally surrendered. The battle's been won, folks. It's resolved. Your king has won, and he has made everything from that victory available to you. Hillsong has a song uh, called At the Cross, and it actually comes from this passage. It talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so someone took that song and also put it together with the crucifixion uh, in the movie The Passion, and I thought it was a good place to wrap up what Romans 8 is all about. If he has not withheld his son from you, will he not freely give you all things? Let's watch this.
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, or powers, or height, or depth, or anything else in creation is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, that your work through the life of Jesus, clothing your divinity in flesh, dwelling among us, and then sacrificing that life in our place, the work of the love of God is complete. The work of the love of God is secure. And Lord, the work of the love of God blows my mind. Lord, may you impress upon our heart how much you love us. May it create in us a new confidence in the work you are doing in us. May we have more confidence in our ability to come to you and to call on you to give us victory in our struggles in our life. May we never doubt how much you care for us in the smallest of ways when you've taken care of us in the greatest of ways. Dear God, may we never forget that you did not spare your own son so we have all of your heart is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, gentlemen, you've got table time there. And let's discuss together.